Good evening. Welcome to News at 10 on TV3, also live on DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. We're live on our various social media platforms on Facebook. It's TV3 Ghana. Ahead of World Hepatitis Day tomorrow, we'll be having a conversation on Hepatitis B in Ghana. But first, let's begin with the stories that's made headlines today. In the highlights tonight, farmers in Otinkran and its adjoining communities in Naguna West Municipality of the Central Region are agitating over the sale of farmlands to the Kwabibim Oil Company. The company is said to have acquired the lands from the owners to place the cocoa farms with palm trees, which is alleged to be under the One District One Factory Initiative. Also, shortage of oil palm is affecting production of palm kernel oil at Asamankuma in the Ofenso municipality in the Ashanti region. Chelsea Ifafrim Puma reports few producers still in the business are calling on government to invest in oil palm plantation to resuscitate the sector. Now, the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Stephanie Sullivan, has reaffirmed the United States' commitment to strengthening partnership with African navies to fight maritime crime. The ambassador was speaking at a ceremony to welcome Carson City, a U.S. naval support ship, to the Tema port. And 55 bodies have been recovered so far off the Libyan coast, an aid worker said on Saturday after a wooden boat carrying hundreds of migrants capsized on Thursday. Search operations are continuing to find other missing migrants. Let's now do the big one. Now, farmers in Otenkrai and its adjoining communities in the Aguna West Municipality of the Central Region are agitating over the sale of farmlands to the Kwaibibim Oil Company. The company is said to have acquired the lands from the owners to replace the cocoa farms with palm trees, which is alleged to be under the One District, One Factory Initiative. Lucy Ayambila has been following the story. Otinkrang and its adjoining communities are predominantly cocoa farming communities within the Aguna West municipality. Farmers in these communities are crying foul over the sale of farmlands by the landowners to the Kwaibibrem Oil Company. According to farmers, about 15,000 acres of farmlands have been graded to pave way for nursing and planting of palm trees. They say they feel cheated with the compensation given them by the company. No negotiation, no arrangement, no meeting. Everything came in the form of impose. Yes, from the, our land owners, they came and they said they have sold their land to a Bible Moyer company. I was about harvesting the cocoa when they came to the farm to grade everything, including cassava planting and cocoa. They gave me 1,000 CDs for my maize farm and 40 CDs for 66 palm trees. Now my family and I are hit by hunger. Meanwhile, the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, who is the Member of Parliament for Aguna West, Cynthia Morrison met with farmers at Otenkrang to calm tempers and assure them of government support. Today is a very sad day, one of the saddest days, because two months ago they called me that we, somebody is coming here to um, put up a factory, one district, one factory, and I told them I haven't heard of it. So quickly I rushed here to see. So when I got there, I'm like, what is this? And they said we're doing, um, they're planting palm nuts or whatever. So I just, um, I asked them, are you put up a factory here? They said no. We have we haven't seen it and we're sending it to the eastern region. So I said, I was like, no, I want to see your course. So I gave them my card, I want to see your course, let's talk about it. Because 
if your factory is in the eastern region, you can't also deprive our cocoa farmers their livelihood. She donated some food items to the affected farmers who, as a result of the destruction of their food crops, complained of hunger. I have some bags of rice for you. Please share it amongst yourselves. But I'll plead with those of you who were not affected to show some love to the affected ones by being supportive. We gathered that the proposed palm farm will feed the factory, which is in the eastern region. Now, the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Stephanie Sullivan, has reaffirmed the United States' commitment to strengthening partnership with African navies to fight maritime crime. The ambassador was speaking at a ceremony to welcome Carson City, a U.S. naval support ship, to the Tema port. Carson City sailed from Europe to Ghana. The United States naval ship is used as a fast transport vessel in the military lift command. She is manned by four military officers with 26 civilian crew on board. The seven out of nine newly built naval ship can also transport 600 tons of military cargo on 1,002 nautical miles. The visit to Ghana is part of the African Partnership Station deployment, which she made a stop at 2nd D for engagement with the Western Naval Command. The two navies exchange knowledge in both maintenance, maritime law and extend medical and outreach services to health institutions in 2nd D. The United States Ambassador to Ghana, Stephanie Sullivan, was hopeful maritime security corporations will be deepened. We formally welcome the USNS Carson City to both Ghana and the Gulf of Guinea, where the crew will continue to conduct maintenance engagements with additional nations in the region and carry out assessments and workshops on best practices. Deputy Minister for Defense, Major Derek Odro, said government is appreciative of several interventions by the U.S. government. For your strong bond of relationship with our Navy and urge the two navies to continue to enhance their collaboration to deal with the increasing insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea, which is a global strategic highway for maritime commerce. The U.S. Navy ship Carson City is in Ghana as the country prepares to welcome the U.S. Speaker of Congress, Nancy Pelosi. She is the third in command after the U.S. President and his vice. News at 10 is back with more stories after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching News at 10 on TV3. We're also live on DSTV Channel 279. Let's talk about our health now because the Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana has called on government to, as a matter of urgency, enact an anti-discriminatory law to protect people with Hepatitis B in Ghana. Ahead of the World Hepatitis Day, which is Sunday, July 28, Hepatitis Alliance Ghana, in a statement, urged government to invest in Hepatitis Awareness Program. The organization insists the fear of being stigmatized, rejected and discriminated against motivates persons with hepatitis to conceal their status from family and friends. They are also calling for a review of the policy on the administration of hepatitis vaccinations to newborn babies in the country. For longer on this, uh, let me tell you a lot more about hepatitis B prevalence in Ghana. Now, viral hepatitis B and C are leading infectious disease killers. It affects 3 to 5 million people worldwide, leading to 1.4 million deaths every year. Now, data from health facilities revealed a total of 117905 viral hepatitis cases were seen. Let me continue with that. 
between 2014 and 2018, out of which 41 deaths were recorded. An adult population of 12.3% live with hepatitis B, but hardly sought for medical help or disclosed their status due to stigma from health workers and society. So that is the situation now when it comes to hepatitis B in Ghana as well as across the world. Let's stay a while longer on this. And Charles Ampong AJ is the executive director of the Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana and joins me in studio for a discussion on this development. Thank you, sir, for joining us on News at 10. Thank you. Let me first begin with how you would describe government's efforts in helping fighting hepatitis B. I think lack of political will appears to threaten the possibility of Ghana eliminating viral hepatitis by 2030. Mm -hmm. Our investment when it comes to hepatitis programs has been very low. And I think that what we need to do as a country is possibly to find ways to sponsor or even put more resources into hepatitis education, implement the newly developed guideline, which was launched just yesterday, and also to build the capacity of healthcare providers. And by so doing, we can meet the NACI target by 2030. Mm. You're calling for the enactment of the anti-discriminatory law against hepatitis B. Is the situation that bad to require a regulation like this? It's really bad. According to a research study that we conducted in Northern Ghana and Southern Ghana, we got to know that some secondary school authorities mm. isolate students who test hepatitis B positive and put them in classrooms instead of the dormitories. And some parents are even compelled in some situations to rent non-residential accommodations for their, for their wards. So you can imagine the implication. Again, we have also picked some information that there are some job opportunities that people with hepatitis B lose because they test positive are following medical ed 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 examination. And also, there has also been incidents where because of hepatitis B, some marriages are not permitted in certain religious cycles. So this, mm -hmm of course, tells us that the issue of stigma is emerging in our context and we have to do something about that. Mm. Have, have you found out how these stigmatization cases um, impact on productivity and even on the people who, who carry the disease? Yes, it, is, it has a, its own implications. For example, you know that the quality of life of every individual is very important. And now, these individuals, because of stigmatization, their quality of life is affected. So they go into the state of even depression some nature suicidal ideations and it is not something which is so um, different from other contexts because we have also recorded cases in other locals where students were handled that way and mm. eventually they committed suicide even in their dormitories so the effect is so huge the major complication when it comes to this is the fact that people will then conceal their status mm. and therefore we cannot break the transmission cycle because you must encourage people to tell their status so that their household contacts can also get vaccinated against mm. the infection. Mm. So as an association, before we even take it to the level of government, what has the association been doing to help reduce um, the, case, the new case of hepatitis B and as well as the stigmatization? We recognize the healthcare providers as very important stakeholders. So what we have been doing over the years is to build the capacity of the providers. We have done that in Northern Ghana, in Southern Ghana. So we can say that in terms of awareness creation, we are also doing, we are also finding individuals by doing testing and linking these individuals to care. Mm -hmm. So eventually they get the required laboratory or clinical monitoring so that their life or their well-being can be improved. Mm. And then you are also asking government to enact this law. What other interventions are you calling for? I think the most critical thing has to do with the law. Mm -hmm. because this individual's life must be protected. So now that we are taking our recording packet of stigma in the country, we need to start from somewhere immediately before it explodes. That is number one. The second thing has to do with building the capacity of the providers. Okay. And again, also creating more awareness so that people can understand the etiology of the disease and its mode of transmission, particularly emphasizing on the fact that sweat is not a vehicle for hepatitis B transmission so that that will reduce the stigma that is somehow fooled by this inaccurate information mm. among the general population. Mm. All right, thank you very much for speaking with us. Charles Ampong Eje is Executive Director of the Hepatitis Alliance of Ghana. You're watching News at 10 on TV3. We're back with more after this break. Don't go away.
There are lots of amazing stories out there. What we do on News 360 is to bring to you the most compelling news by teasing out the right pieces that bring the stories to life. My job is to present to you the news in the most gripping manner and asking the critical questions that bring out the needed detail out of the stories. My name is Alfred Okunze. Join me on News 360, Monday through to Friday, 7 p.m. on air and online only on TV3. Life is a reality. Believe that drama tells our story. Believe in action. Believe that our kids are our future. Is only. Believe in the game. Quality entertainment and credible information. Keep watching TV3. First in news, best in entertainment. Breaking news. And now, this is the Akan version of TV3. Onia TV. Credible, brilliant, and richly entertaining local content for your viewing pleasure. Onia TV. Yet, Jinny Wongopa. Welcome to Date Rush. Who is your kind of person for a dream date? A cool, handsome guy. Cool, cute guy. We all want cool, handsome guys. I don't see my type of guys. Want a date? No more gnashing. I'm afraid of muscular guys. Damn smooth. I don't like it. Tanya says, I like the way he's dancing. He can't swing, swing. Oh my God. On season two of Date Rush, your dream date with an ideal partner is about to come true. To participate, send your pictures and details to WhatsApp line 0547 939 417. What don't you like about Adam? He's fair and I like dark guys. I don't even like the way he talks, it turns me off. He said he likes pretty ladies and I don't see myself to be pretty. I'm sure. He looks like a bad boy and I love bad boys. Oh boy! Date Rush, back on TV3. Date Rush, coming soon on TV3. <laughs> Welcome back. Five wildlife guards lost their lives in the line of duty between 2013 and March 2019. The unfortunate incident, according to the Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission, is as a result of the activities poachers who killed the last guard in the Bia National Park in the Western Region. The wildlife guards under the Wildlife Division of the Forestry Commission are mandated to protect the wildlife conservations in the country. However, these men were ill-prepared and ill-equipped to face the poachers who are often armed to the teeth. As a result, some ill-motivated poachers turned their arms on these patriotic citizens, killing at least five within the last six years while maiming several others. These prompted the Forestry Commission to begin training the forest and wildlife guards. So far, about 690 field staff have been trained from the Forest Service, Wildlife Division and the Rapid Response Unit at the 64 Infantry Regiment Training Camp in Isutrari. The target of the commission is to train at least 1,000 field staff before the end of the year. The fifth batch of 145 staff have completed a three-week training at the 64 Infantry Regiment Training Camp. This, the commission believes, will prepare the field staff in self-defense and the defense of the biodiversity. We also know the situation in which you are going to you know, find yourself. Uh, there are new uh, and imminent challenges, like the poaching, because you are confronted with most of the time with poachers. You also come against the illegal loggers. We will expect that we will see improvement uh, in your, um, you know, your capacity to deal with uh, those uh, circumstances. Uh, we also have um, Galamse, illegal mining, uh, and the impact is so severe that uh, we would expect that 
you will be able to contend with some of those uh, challenges. Board Chairman of the Forestry Commission, Brigadier General Joseph Ade, urged the trained staff not to indulge themselves in doing. Don't take it to beat your wives or your girlfriends or go to town to beat other people. This is to encourage you to be able to meet the challenges we have today in the forestry. Illegal mining, illegal logging, and now the poaching. The people have become more militant, and they are prepared to kill. So we have to also take the, the necessary steps so that those of you who perform the duties on behalf of the commission you are also equipped to meet the challenges. The Commission further hinted at plans to employ more staff in view of the increasing challenge in protecting Ghana's forest reserves. To something rather unfortunate, the Siakwa Salvation Army teacher George Somwa, who was lynched by six youth, has been laid to rest at the Siakwa Methodist Church. The teacher was brutally beaten to death owing to a dispute over snails three years ago. The late teacher had been at his current post for close to two years before his demise. Several mourners at the Isiakwa Methodist Church could not hold back their tears during the service. His daughter, in a tribute, described him as the best dad. Wow, such a great man indeed. If all fathers were like you, I bet there would be no pain in this world. With her that radiated love and warmth, you are truly missed daddy and forever remembered. Members of the Ghana National Association of Teachers were emphatic that no teacher should be lynched to death. Words cannot describe how wonderful he was to the entire family. It was indeed very disheartening to accept the sudden departure of a beloved brother, especially what we did not hear of any ailment that affected him. The late teacher left behind a wife and two children. Meanwhile, court proceedings on the murder case would be heard on July 31 at Chibi. We wish the family well and may his soul rest in peace. Away from that, the Member of Parliament for Ifutu, Alexander Apenyoma King, says he will continue to fight for the people of Ifutu until the right thing is done or the university, at the University of Education, Winneba. He stressed that some cities in other countries which universities have used their universities to develop their communities, hence same must be seen in Winneba. Alexander Apenyoma King said this when he was presenting a 100,000 Ghana city check to the Winneba Mobile Money Merchant Association in the central region. The 100,000 city check is a seed capital to support members of the Winneba Mobile Money Merchants Association in their business. Member of Parliament for the area, Alexander Fenyomarkin said, the gesture is a way of reviving the private sector to improve the socio-economic development of the Afuti constituency. If we don't give you the needed support, we will have nothing. And crime rate will go up, will be high. People will be stealing. There's unemployment. In today's Winneba, a lot of people want government to employ them, but government cannot employ everyone. But if we encourage those of you in the private sector, I'm sure you will be a self-made man. He maintained he is committed to the development of the people, thus his efforts to ensure University of Education gets at least 30% of its resources from the community. If you go to UK, United Kingdom, Oxford is a university town. That is their tourism, that is their economy, that is their everything. There's a relationship between the community and the university. If you go to Buckingham University where I was, Buckingham is a small town, but because of the university, there's a new economy. That's all we have for tonight. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Log on to 3 and get some other stories. Good evening.